Belgium complex. Uh, there. Where Mike Lee. Uh, oh, whoa, Bill, what? No. Mike Lee? That, 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 that's somewhere down the line. guy. My, my Florence. Uh, yay! Yeah, I don't have any information on the silver bullet or any of that. No, it's all about, about baby penis. Right? Yep. Tonight I'm going to talk about reality and what it means right now. What our reality means. Stretching from misinformation on the internet to what can be trusted to the cyber attack that happened on Sony and what it means for us. So we're talking about our reality today at this moment. Um, Tim, you got me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Slide. Um, when I was a kid, born in America, but growing up in Japan, I wanted the pioneer's life. The very idea of Daniel Boone standing in front of a forest with no trails, no maps, frankly thrilled me. There was something about discovering the rules for the first time. Perhaps that's why I couldn't wait to be a hippie, left home at 12, never went back, and have always been attracted to subcultures. I had no way of knowing that the internet would end up being my wild frontier. Reality is that which exists. The unreal does not exist. The unreal is merely that negation of existence which is the content of human consciousness when it attempts to abandon reason. Millions of people may have believed in Zeus. Today, millions of people are atheists to Zeus. There is no alternative to existence. Existence itself is self-sufficient. There is nothing apart from existence. There is no alternate to it. Now, you can ignore cyberspace. You can only use your computer as a typewriter. But as we are learning, the cyber world exists. It is as real as Earth, land, and air. <coughs> It can have repercussions that even if we try to ignore them in our daily life will come back to bite us on the ass. To be aware of reality is to be aware of consciousness and identity. One can't say I love you until you can say I. A consciousness conscious of nothing is a contradiction. Before you can identify consciousness, there must be something for you to be conscious of. It was Marshall McLuhan who said, the medium is the message. The internet jet propelled us from news a day old to news up to the minute. Its messages are all secondary to the instrument itself. The internet is more important than the message. As for the messages, we all have heard, I saw it on the internet, so it must be true. And that joke is not meant to bolster faith in information on the internet. But is this distrust of information correct? Should, for example, students use Wikipedia as a source? 
The journal Nature decided to investigate this by taking articles from the Encyclopedia Britannica, which schools do allow students to use, and Wikipedia, which most schools do not allow students to use. Believe it or not, there hadn't been a study before on this, just the knowledge everyone knows that you can't trust the internet. Once again, what everyone knows turned out to be wrong. The encyclopedia was wrong 2.92 times in each article. <laughs> Wikipedia was wrong 3.80 times. Less than 1% difference. That means Wikipedia is just as reliable as the Encyclopedia Britannica. The academic community is capable of falling for anti-internet propaganda as anyone else is. Professors barring the use of Wikipedia are being silly. That the myth swept academia shows that there's a bias that people have between a hard book and the internet, which is really what they were barring. In reality, the message is not lost in cyberspace, and the method of putting Wikipedia together clearly works. Now, is there bad information on the internet? Of course. The same biases we all carry find their ways onto the web. There are tens of thousands of websites that say Joe McCarthy headed the Hollywood 10 hearings. Not only that, they tend to put both Hollywood hearings blurred into one. So you find thousands upon thousands of websites that mix up the 1947 hearings with the Hollywood 10. And I'm sure there's plenty of anti-Joe McCarthy professors at college that do the same. But by going back to the original documents, all those websites and professors instantly go from being experts to being political hacks. You might as well believe in Zeus. Let's take a look at this first slide here. You can see the idea that women's voting rights is tied to voting. Um, it says voting changed whether women could have the right to vote. Well, if there was a vote, what women voted on it when they didn't have the vote? So how does that work when most men opposed it at the time? Woodrow Wilson was shocked when women protested at the White House for the right to vote. The police were summoned who clubbed the women and took them to jail. At the jail, some were stripped and put in drunk tanks and the cops let it be known they were leaving for the evening. Others were beaten again in their jail cells and placed in cells with men who were told, you know, we're leaving for the evening. So the men could do whatever they wanted to them. The women declared a hunger strike to protest their conditions and would eventually be forced fed in jail. There was no vote on this. Woodrow Wilson let it be known that under no circumstances would he ever allow women to have the vote. Then in 1918, something incredible happened. The White House issued a statement that he had changed his mind and supported the vote for women. So how did Woodrow go from beating, allowing rape, and force-feeding suffragettes 
to issuing a simple statement that he had changed his mind. A heart attack. A heart attack incapacitated Woodrow Wilson, and his wife Edith took over. My guess is she issued the statement after hiding Woodrow's condition from everyone. So voting did not bring women to vote. And by the way, have you ever heard any politician given credit for getting women to vote? That's because there wasn't one. A heart attack changed the climate. And by the way, women did not get the vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. White women got the vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. White women got the vote. Nobody else, no Asians, no black women. But this card has an ulterior motive that I'll get to in a second. Now, the 40-hour work week came from Henry Ford. Nobody voted on whether or not people at Ford Motor Company were going to work 40 hours a week. Environmental laws came from Nixon, who was not at the time backed by the ecologists. There were no elections for the minimum wage, which was opposed by all major unions who feared it would create a ceiling on what union people could make. <laughs> so what is the purpose of this sign? Propaganda. It means to imply one party help make all these reforms go through when in fact, the party it is trying to imply did this, in fact, back lynching, segregation, and blocking minorities from government jobs, voting, or marrying whites. As for abortions, we didn't vote on abortions either. A conservative Supreme Court made abortion legal, while millions of Catholic Democrats flooded the court with petitions to try to stop it. Millions of Catholic Democrats, not fundamentalist Republicans who didn't even exist then. Not quite the way we're being taught it today, is it? No one is more attacked in today's political climate than conservative women. Nobody. Liberal men are not allowed to criticize women in general. Liberal men are not allowed to say anything bad about women unless they're conservative. And then they unleash a tirade you cannot believe the anger, the hatred, the anti-gay feelings are allowed to be unleashed on conservative women. Don't like Ann Coulter, but can't counter her claims or beliefs? Start a rumor she had a sex change. There are over a quarter of a million websites that dismiss everything Ann Coulter says because no woman would think that way. She must be a man who had a sex change. Don't like Sarah Palin saying that Democrats would have no idea what to do if Putin attacked the Ukraine? Well, twist her words. Tell people she said she could see Russia from her porch, which she never said. Ridicule the twist. It's a simple game. And you get to unleash all that pent-up hatred from the divorce you went through with your wife because you're not allowed to do that in front of your Democratic friends. Why Democratic women put up with these attacks 
on conservative women, I don't know. Jokes about women's looks, whether women are capable of having thoughts. I have no idea why Democratic women don't stop and go, wait, you're attacking all women. But woe to any Republican who dares attack Pelosi or Hillary and says she had a sex change or says, twists her words into things she didn't say to attack her. You do that to a Democrat woman, you will wish you were never born. Yet they do it to conservative women like a knee-jerk reaction. They don't even think about it. I don't think it's possible. Next slide, please. Next one. No, yeah, next one. Oh, this is Sarah Palin next. Okay. I don't think it's possible to be more hated than Ayn Rand. People who have never read her line up to attack her. She celebrated Christmas, they say, but she's an atheist. She denounced Social Security as a Ponzi scheme, but she took it herself. I don't have to read her, the haters say. That's all I need to know. Well, she explained that in our country, Christmas or any holiday is not tied to any religion. If Christians claim that it's tied to a religion, which they've been allowed to do for many years, there's nothing written about Christmas being a holiday to celebrate Jesus. Anybody can celebrate Christmas. In fact, the very thing that the left hates about Christmas, its commercialization, is exactly what young people learn about capitalism. All these things created <laughs> just to bring pleasure. No other purpose. Just to find the gift that brings pleasure. And she was in her early 20s when she was asked about Social Security. Take it, she said, or it will just be absorbed into the war machine. She said that before she was 25 years old. This isn't new, but yet in the last two years you hear people go, and Rand, oh, she celebrated Christmas. Oh, she took Social Security. Well, yeah, in her 20s, she was telling people, take Social Security or the military will. <laughs> Not quite the way we hear it today. Now let's take a look at religious myths we find on the web. Next one. First off, there is no apple in Genesis. Now, I should point something out here over the next few slides. I've always told atheists the biggest mistake that they ever make is arguing the Bible with religious people. Because 99% of religious people have never read the Bible. They tried to read it when they were 10 or 11, but it's very boring, and it isn't just the Bible, it's a, like a bunch of books all packed into one, and they gave up at 10 or 11, and they never go back. So trying to show inconsistencies in the Bible and things like that is fun, and we're going to have some fun right now, but it's not going to win over people because people don't become religion because of reality or facts. Okay, I can stand here and say that Jesus smoked Chesterfields, and he loved Chesterfields. And you could stand up and say, Michael, I know for a fact Chesterfield cigarettes didn't exist when Jesus was around. And I can respond with, you must have faith. <laughs> okay? So arguing with people using what I'm about to give you about religion doesn't really work. They become religious at the same time they learn about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, um, the fairy tooth 
uh, mother, and they spend the rest of their life trying to figure out which of those stories, the Easter Bunny, Jesus, Santa Claus, God, etc., are true. Don't we? Yep. But they hit us when we're, we can't even speak. We don't even have language, and they tell us we have to believe. Now, there was no apple in Genesis. Eve saw a tree with food, but there's no mention of what the food is. Pomegranate? Apple? Pear? Peach? Nobody knows. Next slide. Now, um, go to the next one. Oh, go back, go back. Okay. If you could go back to, no, back. You're going forward. Hang on, Michael, I'll have to. Which one, right? Well, let's leave this one on for right now for a second. Um, I'll point out here, what about the three wise men? They didn't visit on the night of Jesus' birth. People mix up two different books. Um, they came years later. Yet how many manger scenes do you see every Christmas in front of people's homes with, or even churches with the three kings there? Um, it states in Matthew 2.11 that after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary. Well, house is not the same as a manger. So there were no three kings giving incense, which I consider to be a pretty shitty gift anyway. Um, there were no three kings at the manger. And why every manger scene of every church has this? Because they don't know the facts anymore. Okay, what was the last one? Jonah and the whale. Well, for Jonah and the whale... Um, did a whale swallow Jonah? Who knows? All it says in the Bible was it was a great fish. They knew what whales were, but they didn't credit a whale with swallowing Jonah. It just says a great fish swallowed Jonah. He was able to set up home in there. What was the word? And some people actually believe this could happen. Um, let's go on forward now. Um, money. Money is the root of all evil. Actually, Timothy 16, or excuse me, Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. So, it isn't really guns are the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. The, the way we think of these things now it is for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Next up, we did that one. Now, there is no mention in the Bible of the seven deadly sins. But how many times have we heard about the seven deadly sins? Gluttony, lust, etc., etc., they're not even in the Bible. Okay? Cool Next one. up. Now, Jesus. Look at our Jesus here. First off, Jesus had nothing to say about homosexuality. He had nothing to say about slavery. In fact, in the United States, when we had slaves, the South said, if slavery is wrong, why didn't Jesus say it was in the Bible? And that was enough to justify slavery. But Jesus, and there was slavery at the time, didn't even think it was worth mentioning. Nor did he say anything against homosexuals. Now here's an odd footnote. The Borgias were a murderous family who poisoned and slaughtered their way to power. A Borgia became Pope. But he despised the look of Jesus. 
who up until then had no beard, curly hair, a lump in his nose, and looked Jewish. So he demanded that all representations of Jesus be destroyed. In their place, he had his illegitimate son pose as Jesus. Suddenly, Jesus had long, straight hair, a straight nose, blue eyes, blondish hair. Now, here's an interesting footnote. People who have had near-death experiences don't see the original Jewish-looking Jesus. They all report seeing the murderous Borgia Jesus. Could all those prayers to the wrong deity have created an evil power? The Borgia Jesus? Well, if it turns out I'm wrong about religion, and you find yourself at the pearly gates, and this guy shows up, clearly it is a test. Run. Run as fast as you can. You don't want to go to Borgia heaven. Next. Cleanliness is next to godliness is credited to John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist branch of Christianity. But he actually said, slovenliness is not part of religion. Next up. <clears throat> now before I tell you about this guy, I should also point out that there is no devil in the Bible. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, the hell is a waiting room. After Jesus dies in the New Testament, you know that he goes to hell where there's supposedly a huge war raging, except he just walks right in, picks out Moses and a few of the prophets, and takes them out. It's one of the biggest anticlimaxes in the Bible, because you've been led to believe there's a huge war going on between the angels, and it's life or death between God and Lucifer, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus just walks in, to a room like this and says, you, you, and you, come with me to heaven, we're leaving. And no one tries to stop him? This is worse than when in the um, Star Wars movie, Darth Vader becomes Darth Vader by the guy just turning to him and saying, you're now Darth Vader. What a letdown. Do something to show you deserve it. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, there is no devil in the Bible, and in the Old Testament, hell is just a waiting room. There's no torture. In fact, we're all going to end up there, because according to the Bible, we have to wait until the end times, where we'll be taken out of hell. So just think, all the people who died when Jesus was around are still waiting in hell for them to be saved if you believe them. Now, the Lord works in mysterious ways as nowhere in the Bible and wasn't actually thought of until the 18th century. Which brings us to this guy. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free one slave. Robert E. Lee freed more slaves than Lincoln ever did. A constitutional amendment, which only passed because the South wasn't allowed to vote on it, freed the slaves after Lincoln died. This freed absolutely no one. It's a myth. Now, by now you've seen the message is secondary to the cyber world of ones and zeros. I can bring information to shatter myths, however, that I have found on the internet. 
Like the one that states the two political parties flipped around 1968. Now don't tell that to anyone in Chicago who was here during the convention. But today, young people are taught in colleges that somehow the Democrats and Republicans flipped in 1968. And that the Democrats who were pro-segregation, pro-lynching, and prone to race riots flipped over and all became Republican. Okay, next one. Uh, we can go one more after that. Oh, but okay, here we go. Now, by using this claim, Democrats have erased the Lester Maddoxes, the Bull Connors, from their affiliation with the KKK and their opposition to civil rights le legislation for decades. And yet, of the 21 Democratic senators to oppose the Civil Rights Act of 1964, guess how many switched and became Republicans? 10? 15? Zero. 20? One. Who, who switched eight years later? One. So where's this big flip? You never hear anymore about Al Gore Sr., who kept talking for hours to keep a vote from happening on the Civil Rights Act. You don't hear about Robert Byrd, who was a Democrat, who also fought the Civil Rights Act and helped Al Gore go on for hours trying to stop the vote. You don't hear about Sam Irvin, the uh, Watergate prosecutor, or the head of the Watergate Committee, who fought the Civil Rights Act and actually tried to have it repealed. All of their images are now suddenly cleaned up. They're all really good people. In 19... So, let's take a look here. In 1968, we see that George Wallace carried the South, these yellow states here. He ran with the American Independent Party and supported the Vietnam War. Next, Matt. Okay. Four years later, Nixon runs against the first modern candidate. The Democrats deliberately patterned McGovern after Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington because the image before him was always the boss, the guy who's going to give you jobs, the guy who's going to give you work. That was starting to wear thin, so they decided that they needed a human face. Um, now, we'll also remember that uh, Tom e Ingleton, or Eagleton was McGovern's running mate. When the compassionate Democratic Party discovered that he had been hospitalized for depression, they kicked him off the ticket. <laughs> so, you know, the rhetoric only goes so far that they're not going to interfere with the reality. Um, but we can see here that Nixon swept the whole country. He didn't just carry the South. He swept everywhere except for Massachusetts up here, which should have let, it, which should have let us know that the Bay Area was going off the deep end. Um, next up. Jimmy Carter ran four years later against Ford and Carter. Um, but he had a, a, if you look at Jimmy Carter, he not only carried the South of what was considered the Republican area, but he carried up through the New England states, uh, which was kind of a surprise at the time. Uh, the other surprise at the time, which we've all forgotten, was that McGovern didn't carry Illinois. Illinois was carried by Ford. So already there were Democrats cheating on how they voted. Okay, on the next one, um, well, let's go back. <clears throat> we 
Okay. Um, Clinton versus Bush. Uh, Clinton reversed the Reagan sweep. I, I skipped over the Reagan years because Reagan took everything. Um, it, it was a, a clean sweep across the board. Um, but we can see here that the southern states are equally split up between Clinton and Bush. There is no flip. There never was a flip. So what Democrats are really saying when they tell you that there was a flip that happened in 1968 is they are saying, we don't want to talk about what the Democratic Party was like before 1968. We don't want to go into the Klan. We don't want to go into any of it. That's what they're really saying. Information and data is what computers were meant for and are the nemesis of urban legends. So what is this new world of ones and zeros where governments can be taken down, our privacy invaded, and we can have access to all the museums and libraries and now even some colleges online. Well, this new world, this cyber world, lacks a Bill of Rights. How does it measure up to the rights that we have? The First Amendment covers speech. So how does hate speech Cyberbullying, Al Qaeda manuals on the internet fit in. The Second Amendment. Is there a right to be a hacker? Is hacking for information of wrongdoing as important as a gun to protect yourself against your government? The Third Amendment pertains to soldiers and homes. Should private companies <clears throat> be prevented from being recruited by governments to run hot bots or phishing operatives <laughs> operations on your computer? <laughs> the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. Are our emails private? Pictures on a photo service, who owns them? Our emails are on remote servers. And guess what? By law, they don't need a warrant to go into our emails. Should we allow that? Now, the Fifth Amendment is about being tried twice for the same crime. Is unlocking emails self-incriminating. What if the government gets your passwords? The Seventh Amendment is the right to trial and jury. But what happens if cyber courts begin to develop and those courts put you on trial for what you've done on the internet? The Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. Well, how do we determine what a cybercrime is? The Ninth Amendment. What is our right to privacy on the Internet, on cyberspace? There's so many questions, but wait. I got more. How much government do we want in cyberspace? Do we have a right to connect to the Internet? Do we have a right to speak freely on the internet? Do we have a right to speak in our own language? 80% of the internet is now in English. Do we have a right to use this space to assemble without an organization? Do we have a right to act on the internet? Do we have a right to control data on the internet? Do we have the right to an identity online? What is public good on the internet? Should the internet be operated openly? 
So many questions, all of which have one thing in common. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have approached even one of them. Neither the Democrats or the Republicans have begun to understand this reality that we have today. None of them have said we may need a cyber bill of rights so that the rights that we have here in this room are the same rights we have on the internet. And now I want to get into something that just happened, which was the hacking of Sony. When Sony was hacked, it was presumed to be North Korea. My own suspicion, and this is a suspicion, it is not put out there as a fact, is that it was done by another party for money. And then two weeks later, when the money demand was dropped, and the only demand was not to show the movie The Interview, I believe North Korea bought the hack. In other words, somebody else set up the hack. It was probably not North Korea. Two weeks in, they buy the hack, pay the money for it, because originally, for two weeks, every day, Sony was being told, give us money, give us money. Then after two weeks, suddenly it was, don't show the interview. So I think North Korea bought the hack. But this is only speculation. Um, Kim Jong-un certainly turn lemons into lemonade. North Korea has a pattern, okay? And in poker, you look for patterns from the people you're playing so you can figure out what the game is. This is my guess on North Korea's game, okay? Every time there are military exercises, off the coast of Korea that come in too close. They threaten nuclear attacks. They threaten war. They threaten us and South Korea with everything they have. This even they've even responded to photos they thought were bad of Kim Jong un. But really what they're doing is telling their own people they have no fear of imperialists. That's us. By portraying themselves as hot-headed, irrational, and aggressive, they get across the message, we're dangerous. Don't mess with us. North Korea has a history of launching these seemingly random attacks. The Sony hack does fit into that pattern. It has fired missiles just short of Japan in 2005, 2006, and 2007. In 2010, North Korea shelled the South Korean island of Yongpyong and sank a South Korean naval ship. It set off nuclear warheads in 2006, 2009, and 2013. In 2009, they launched cyber attacks on South Korean and U.S. government websites against South Korean banks in 2011, and again in 2013. Every time North Korea exploded with threats and over-the-top rhetoric while denying they had anything to do with the hacks. By doing this, North Korea hopes to deter its far stronger enemies from doing something. By keeping the peninsula in a state of tension and conflict, they hope to keep us out and reinforce the idea that New North Korea is in a constant state of war to its own people. 
All of this serves to maintain North Korea's physical security. Plus, they do win. When Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton went to North Korea, nothing really changed. But it was shown as a great victory for North Korea to the North Korean people. Or Sony pulling the release of the interview. How can that be anything but a victory for North Korea? All this helps Kim Jong-un stay in power. Cybersecurity experts have come forward to say that the FBI had zero understanding of the hacks. If that's true, the situation is even worse in that a 15-year-old knows more about hacking than the FBI. Which is worse? Now, follow me here with my belief that North Korea is neither crazy, irrational. We think of North Korea as backwards, yet it has a cyber force that had started in the 1980s. Today it is 3,000 men strong, trained in the Hanhong province at the college there. Russian and Chinese professors teach there, and one Korean defector, Kim Kwang, taught there for two decades before he escaped through China to South Korea. He reports North Korea can hide malware and computer code. Now malware is used to take over your computer so that they can use it to send attacks or spam or whatever depending on the bad hacker that gives you the malware. Anybody that's had it on the computer knows it's a pain to get rid of. But the North Koreans know how to hide the malware so it doesn't show up under security checks. In fact, today on the news, I, I just caught it briefly and wasn't able to jot down any names or anything, but today on the news, someone was saying that the military said that the malware attack on Sony would have gotten by all of our government and military websites. Okay? Now, a North Korean assault on a South Korean bank left it offline for two weeks. For two weeks, people couldn't use their ATM cards. They couldn't deposit or withdraw money. That's how serious it is. On July 7, 2009, North Korea took out South Korean and U.S. government websites. On March 4, 2011, hackers attacked South Korea's presidential website, the foreign ministry, the National Intelligence Service, and the U.S. forces Korean web pages, all in one moment, and several banks. April 12, 2011, the bank Nangiup was taken down for two weeks. On the anniversary of the first day of war with North Koreans, dozens of government and media services were hit with this denial of service attacks. That means once they get the malware on your computer or laptop, they can take it over and start sending hundreds of messages through it. Figure that they have thousands of computers that they've taken over. So all of a sudden people are getting millions of hits on their website, which will bring them down. North Korea has realized that cyber warfare is the future, which we haven't. It is cheaper and faster than building weapons. It can also be done with complete anonymity. North Korea does not have to bomb power plants. They just have to take them offline. North Korea has stated that we knocked out its internet. Probably heard that over the last week. But consider, the last thing on the internet in North Korea was Sony saying they would not release the movie, the interview. 
North Korea's internet is controlled by China's unicorn company. China has had no outage. North Korea's government and party internets, which are separate from the internet for the people, are all still working. So the only website taken down was the one for the people, so they wouldn't see that the interview was in fact being shown. If we did that, it was absolutely stupid because it would have gotten done far more damage to the leadership in North Korea if we had shown the movie was shown. So I hope we didn't. And because none of the other internet in North Korea was effective, and because China's internet wasn't effective, I believe Kim Jong-un just cut off the people's internet so they couldn't see that the movie was being shown. I hope so, because if we did it, we made a stupid mistake. So how should we respond to a cyber attack? It's not Pearl Harbor. The way to think about this is what would have happened if Al-Qaeda had ha attacked the World Trade Center in the middle of the night when no one was there? What would our response be if the buildings went down and no one was in them? <laughs> and it happened at the middle of the night. That's what a cyber attack is. Jim Bolton, John Bolton, is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the U.S. permanent representative of the U.N. And he has come up with a plan for how to deal with this. First, he says, we should presume North Korea, whether they got involved by buying the hack or initiated the hack, was involved, and we should respond disproportionately. We should go far beyond what they did, because what we're really doing is telling China and the world what will happen if they come in and do damage? Not come in and look around, but come in and do damage to financial institutions, to the military, to our way of life. He wants them put back on the terrorist list. He wants... Um, He says, there is no win to President Obama's plan for a proportional, proportional response in cyber warfare. Only by overwhelming North Korea can we send the message, you do not come in and attack us. The problem is, we don't have a definition of warfare for cyber warfare. In our reality today, we're still fighting Pearl Harbor. Okay? We're still thinking in terms of guys lined up here, guys lined up there. Not somebody on a computer bringing down the Pentagon. We're not even thinking on that level. Uh, he says we should create structures of deterrence to prevent attacks. We may have an FBI that can't deal with cyber warfare, we may have cut off one part of North Korea's internet, the part that could have shown the movie being shown. <laughs> we need to concentrate on our own cyber force, which doesn't even exist now. We need a cyber force that can deal with conceptual and asymmetrical warfare. We need greater clarity when we discuss cyber attacks. We have a pretty good idea about escalating levels of violence. We know when threats can escalate to violence. But we don't have any definitions for cyberspace right now. Nothing. And little North Korea just kicked our ass and did a Pearl Harbor, and it looks like it's going to get away with it. 
American private sector, they're sitting ducks for these attacks. As painful as the attack was for Sony, a similar attack on financial institutions, defense firms, <coughs> communications and power industries would have been far worse. We all just got a wake-up call that the American people weren't consulted and haven't been on any of this also brings to mind something I want to toss in. We need to trust the American people. What ended up happening is when the movie, the interview was shown, there were lines down the mall to go see it. People were singing proud to be an American and stuff before the film started. They had packed theaters. Why is it our politicians are afraid to trust us? To let us join and fight. That has to change. Now, last slide please. John Dillinger. Now ladies and gentlemen, I want to point out that this picture ran on the cover of the Chicago Tribune for one edition when John Dillinger died. And the FBI came to the Tribune and said, that sort of glorifies something about him we don't want to glorify. So they censored the picture in all subsequent editions. However, that started one of the first American urban legends. It gave rise to the idea that John Dillinger's penis was on display at the Smithsonian Institution. I had a grandfather who told me he knew someone who had seen it. For decades, it seems everyone had a relative that swore they had seen John Dillinger's penis at the Smithsonian Institution. What are you talking about? It was one of the first it was one of the first urban legends that Snopes exposed and you almost never hear it anymore. The internet stopped a long term rumor. By the way, um, due to the placement of that I actually believe it's a lever that was on the table that they used to raise the table up. So it's actually a lever and not what everyone wanted to believe. But you know, believe whatever you want. And if you had a relative that saw it at the Smithsonian, you're certainly welcome to believe that. But it, uh, it, it's no longer an urban legend. It's been pretty much crushed. Cyberspace, our reality today, and, I, and cyberspace is just as real as the space we're in right now, has more questions than answers. And the problem is, no one, Democrat or Republican, is asking any of the questions. If we don't start, you won't need a giant military force to defeat us. Just a lot of ones and zeros. Thank you. Amen. Well, questions. Time this guy. Time this guy. Five minutes. Questions. We have a question period. And Pat Butler has the first lucky question. Yeah, Mike. Uh, how do we very quickly neutralize uh, North Korea's uh, efforts? And you know me well enough to know by now I leave a wide swath as to the methods available to be used. But what's the quickest way of solving this problem once and for all? Well, it's probably not going to be once and for all until the people in North Korea get rid of that family. Or the military. The part of the, that's or part the of military. The but no uh, I think the first thing that has to happen is that by putting North Korea on the terrorist list, then 
and making sure that we're ruthless about it, every single aspect, um, that's a good start. Now, if we do like we did with Russia, where we didn't like them going into Ukraine, so we did sort of a half-assed blockade. For example, Mayor Daley and his family is still running a billion-dollar firm in Moscow. Don't even ask me how Mayor Daley was able to get a billion dollars, but he and his sons are running a firm out of Moscow. In fact, we're still, Chicago is the sister city to Moscow. If we're going to do it half-ass, it won't work. But if we are going to put them back on the terrorist list, uh, then we need to make sure that they follow every letter and crush them when they don't. That's the first step. But if we do it like we did with Russia, where we tell American firms, oh, you can still stay in Moscow, don't worry about it, it's not going to do any good. What's the least uh, Yes. Uh, Steve? Right. Hey, Mike, great presentation, by the way. Great thought provoking. Really liked it. Uh, on the World Wide Web, which is the World Wide Web, it's not the United States Web, right? Right. You agree? Okay. Well, uh, you mentioned that we have poor control over cyber attack warfare. So let me ask you uh, would you consider child, a child pornography ring as a terrorist group, which we successfully took down? Um. I have heard the, I'm sure you're referring to the rumors that ISIS is selling child porn to raise money. Um, yeah, I would, in that case, definitely. Um, I'm not exactly sure um, how we're going to deal with ISIS. I don't know how to deal with that group. I mean, they capture women and children, they have forced marriages and all this stuff. It's all sorted. Um, but uh, in that case, yeah, definitely. I, I, any weapon we can use against a terrorist group that we have to use. And the fact that the cyber world has, for example, you can now open a bank account with a cyber bank that doesn't even have a building. In Manila, in the Philippines, around the world, there are cyber banks that people go to and put their money in, and no record is made. Um, it, this is absolutely true. We're not dealing with that either. But the cyber world, we have to understand, is just as real as this room we're sitting in now. And we have to start thinking of it that way. I, I would say that 90% of the people I knew didn't even react when someone was hacked. They went, oh, it's just celebrities, who cares? Yeah. They didn't even stop and go, wait a minute, what does this mean? What does this mean for other computer systems? How can this be used against all of us? Uh, we have to break that and we have to realize we just had our Pearl Harbor. We just had our wake up call. How many more of these do we have to go through before we wake up? Um, uh, let's see, Gene Harker. Uh, I, I have heard about uh, Wilson and racism. I hadn't heard about uh, Wilson and women's rights. Could you suggest a book or uh, a website of where I could find out more about that? Well, I can. Are you on the College of Complexes page? Uh, Do you get there? Okay, because I can I can post some links that you can go to. There's also a great book that came out last year on Edith Wilson and how um, at the Treaty of Versailles. And when you think about it, I didn't think about it until I read this book. Um, Edith Wilson did a mom type punishment on Germany. You break a window and what does your mom do? All right, you have to go apologize and you have to pay for that window, young man. And what did Edith Wilson do? She said, you broke it for World War I, you have to pay for all the countries, what they put in, which plunged Germany into a recession, which became inflation, which became depression, which rose the Nazi party, which led to 70 million dead. 
Um, there's a reason feminists don't claim Edith Wilson as the first president. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll uh, post some links on the College of Complexes um, the Yahoo page, I think it is? Yeah. yeah. So that you can check out the book and also information on uh, Woodrow Wilson and his war on the suffragettes. Thank Gene you. Gene Anderson? Uh, I, I, I like to know, we're talking about uh, North Korea and this dictator, right? And you have, uh, your uh, comments uh, uh, remind me of most people, including uh, uh, presidents and other types and so forth. And for some reason or another, this North Korea dude is an idiot, he that, and this, and blah, 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 and this should be done, and that should be done. We was in Cuba, uh, not in Cuba, in 1959 when Castro come to power. He was this, he was that, he blah, 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 embargo. Now, how do we go around picking out countries in heads of these countries that we don't lack, and over here somewhere, all kind of shit is happening? I mean, how do this, this big, Line up behind one another, and let's hate, hate uh, North Korea. Let's hate uh, uh, Castro. Let I, you know. How, how did this come about? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you remember why we have a blockade of Cuba, an embargo on Cuba? Uh, not, uh, not, not formally. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. In 1962, after Thanksgiving Day. Uh, members of Fair Play for Cuba and members of the Cuban consulate were caught in a conspiracy with weapons to blow up subway stations and department stores in New York City on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. Okay? So that is what led to the embargo. They attacked us. We didn't attack North Korea. They attacked us. They attacked Sony. If you attack, in my opinion, to define cyber warfare, I expect spy groups to go into websites they're not supposed to be, to go into emails and read what they're not supposed to read. I expect that because it's the 21st century. But if you go in and you do financial damage, you take down a power grid, you shut down a bank, we have to begin to think of that as an act of war. That is an act of war. You come in and you shut... In fact, I've said this before. I said this when I spoke on 911 here. We were very fortunate that on 911, they attacked the World Trade Center because the banks were wide open. They had almost no security. The Russian mafia was stealing nickels out of everybody's accounts every day. You had teenagers going in and messing with the ATM machines. If Al-Qaeda had taught their people how to use computers and not fly a plane one way, we would still be in the Depression. We would still be destroyed. One question, question is, one question there, Ron, uh -uh. Uh, Pat, yeah, Mike, as a matter of fact, minute, uh, uh, for once, so I, find, for once I find I agree hey. with you, and that's a hey, rare question. event, but, uh, restate your question. Back, getting back to, can you restate the question? Let's start again. I, I will, this, we're still talking about Cuba, and we're talking about that. I asked that question because I want to know this, I've been around a long time. I, I think when now, somebody wait, attacks wait, us... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, my question in the is, military. You, you mentioned why we uh, made the embargo, we right? The, okay, you also have to remember now, since you ain't that young, that what they've been telling us, the people, that include me, that this man is a communist, and that, 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 that he don't let the people have no freedom, and he this and that. that I, this is the first time I heard that somebody attacked us and so forth and so on. Now, 
Don't get me wrong, I'm not surprised at that because if there's nobody attack so us, we so make so some so shit cool. up in order to do what we want to do. But I'm saying the same way with this guy over in Korea. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, Korea, North Korea. What have who, who did he attack over here? Well, he's attacked our websites. Uh, he's uh, shot missiles at Japan, who we have agreements with to protect. Um, he's attacked South Korea. So one more time. That's not an One quarter time. Hold on, hold on. I mean, at, at some point, you have to draw a line and say you cannot, you can't go into Chase Bank and take it down. You can't take down Sony. You can't. Fuck Sony. You really? One quarter time. These fools can't wait. <laughs> All right, Pat. Yeah, Mike, for once I agree with you, and that's a banner day here at the <laughs> But uh, getting back to cyber warfare, which is really the most important thing that you've touched on tonight, you've touched on a lot of stuff. Um, you spoke of a place in North Korea where they trained the cyber experts. <clears throat> You yeah. also spoke uh, of specially trained uh, people in North Korea uh, who are capable of bringing down our entire cyber establishment. Do we know the location of these places? Do we know the address? And what would prevent us from, uh, as von Clausewitz would have put it, solving the problem by other than diplomatic means? Well, here's an interesting thing. Right after the Sony hack <coughs> happened, Obama put someone on his cabinet who, under Bush, advocated a nuclear strike on North Korea. Yeah. What? And this guy what? is now in Obama's cabinet. Um, so I think Rock that was to roll. send a message to North Korea. Um, the thing is, in poker, once you know the guy who's acting nutty is just acting, it changes the way you play. I don't know if we realize that the North Koreans are putting on a show yet. I do. And if I was playing poker with them, you know, I would ignore all their threats and yelling and acting crazy and I'd go, you do this, you will get this response. And I just ignore the rest of this nonsense. Because I think they have discovered that by acting crazy and by appearing crazy to the world, the world will leave them alone and will back off. And then the North Korean government can go to the people and say, we brought America to our knees. We brought Sony to our knees. We got them to back off. Bill Clinton's coming, et cetera, et cetera. We have to quit playing that game. Okay, Charles. Charles. All right, there's no expectation of privacy to put something on the internet. And what you didn't cite any treaty, international law. What what makes you think that this nation exists to protect some stupid company? Where did you base this? No, I, what I said was, you we, in your I said you we, want us to go to war, and you have no legitimate, no basis I said whatsoever. We have and, and international law, treaty. That this is the internet is wide open. We have no cyber bill of Listen, rights. Listen, things were done against me, and they said, Charles, there's no expectation of privacy. And you have no basis for even saying what they did was right or wrong, because you have no standard. And that's what this talk was about. Where did you get this standard? Okay, I, you know, no, I'm saying where did you my get it talk up? Where does it exist? was about the fact that not only does the FBI know, not know how to read hacks, but clearly from the lack of response What's from this hack? administration for two and a half weeks, What's that? When the hacking was going on on Sony, 
They don't know what is how to hack? respond. A hack is when you go into someone's computer and go through the passwords into their oh, privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one question at a time. One question at a time. time. Next. Do that all the time. One question at a time. Next. Uh, you, wait a minute. Rule. You two, go <laughs> on. <laughs> How come Chuck always Shut breaks all the rules? Next. Wait a minute. Next. Wait a minute. No, wait. Next. 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 One finish. question at a time. YouTube knows exactly. Come on. Right. Man. He's ridiculous. They're putting stuff in there. And they go into my computer. Next. Uh, apparently they've gone into Sony's computer. They have uh, yes. so Mike Lee. How can you trust, in this oh, day and age, how can you trust the media, American media with anything? Well, he I don't believe the British, when it comes to ISIS. Those goofy British newspapers. You got editors dummied up. You got reporters. Uh, the media is all corporate. I don't trust the freaking thing I see on the internet. Or well, the, you know, I wish that was I, true. I'm sorry. I don't even yeah. trust the Sony bullshit. Yeah. It's yeah, a way for the publicity was. stuff. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. They're going to bomb us because they're stupid. Movie that Is sucks. there a question there? Thank you. Yeah, how can you trust the media? Oh, Thank you, Mike. I don't trust this crap. Well, yeah. you know what? This thing the media sucks. Interesting oh, fact. Right. When, uh, when, when Operation Paperclip came out, and it was shown that there were 250 CIA agents on the payroll of newspapers in the United States who all reprinted and republished the Joe McCarthy smears and got them into the New York Times and other publications. Guess what people said here when I pointed that out? They said, oh, well, that doesn't count. Well, they were telling the truth then. Oh, really? You can't select your reality. Your reality is what you confront. Right now, the reality we confront is a cyber reality. If you reject declassified CIA files, you say, I don't want to read them about McCarthy, I don't want to know what they say, I don't care, and then the ones come out on torture and you go, hey everybody, look at this! Was Joe You're a McCarthy fraud a hacker? and a hypocrite. Oh. Was Joe McCarthy You're a fake. A One fool at a time. We agree with that. And there's right. a lot of suspected suspected. All right. Next question at a time. I think uh, the media the doesn't Anderson understand this. But see, I don't think I don't I don't think the media understands what just We're happened so to us. I, I mean, when I read their interpretation of what happened with Sony, I don't think... I'll give you an example. Jennifer Lawrence, an actress, had her cell phone hacked. Naked pictures of her were put on the internet. The newspapers were in agony. That was her publicity. They were twisted. No, there were other actresses hit, too. And bullshit. Well, wait, you asked me a question. Do you want me to answer? Okay. So all the newspapers were in agony. Do we publish the photos? And they went, no. They're stolen. We're not going to do that. And then Sony gets hacked. And then Sony's information is taken out. Hey, guess what they said about Angelina Jolie? What? They're taking stolen documents and running to the front page to put them there? When they said it was wrong with Jennifer Lawrence, this is not a victory for privacy, my friend. This, what happened to Sony... Where did you get a right to privacy? Where did you get that? It's not in the Constitution. L.P. Anderson. got to be in the Would you Yeah, tell me the right of privacy. What law is that? Okay. I'm not the one that's causing the trouble. We know that, Get the right to What's privacy? the name of the man that was put in uh, Obama's I can't camera. remember. I'll have to look it up. Or he can oh. look it up right there. What's that? He look just got up. put in two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, after okay. Bush, he had proposed using nuclear weapons on North Korea. You don't remember his name? Oh, no. Yeah. We can find... Have been John Bolton? Don't remember. But if he was... It sounds familiar, though. Don't you mean Buster Bolton? Any kind of war is a good war. The fact that I know all this is pretty stunning, isn't it? <laughs> I can give you dates of North Korea hacks. Come on. Mr. Okay. Okay. Oh, Tim Bolger of that news. All right, Mike. 
you're you've obviously done some research on hacks and things like this. Can you tell me what you know about such things as a deep web, the Tor browser, a little bit about encryption and deep web search engines? Well, encryption is a way to secure and hide the stuff that you have. And in fact, guess who is a big uh, supporter of encryption? Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, when he took those uh, files out of, out of the computers, and he wasn't even in the military, and they gave him access to the highest level of classified files. Uh, Private Manning, anybody remember Private Manning? Yes. He's a private. What the hell is a private doing with access to the highest level of classified documents? Um, it's because we don't really understand the internet, and part of the problem is my generation, our generation, as people age, okay, they are not retiring. As they not retire, younger people who were born on computers are coming in, and the age of the guy in charge of CIA may be Pat Butler's age, who is asking someone at CIA, how do I log on to my laptop? Okay. He doesn't even know how. The internet. And, and Edward Snowden pointed out that if the files had been properly encrypted, he could have never copied them. But the fact is, he said any teenager who knew how to hack could have gotten all the information he did. And that's scary, Tim. That's scary. There is, there is, an, there is a governing structure on the internet, you know. It's called the Request for Comments, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bunch of documents that underlie the signal protocols, the hypertext transfer protocols, and it's the only way they've been able to make this thing work. And it's right, right up there on the screen right well, now. It's all are also about using clouds, and it's like all SoundCloud, yeah. to hide what they're doing. Um, there was a time where terrorists were just hiding their information in drafts in their email and they just give the password to their members to go look at the draft but that brought down a CIA hat not long ago so that's no longer a big secret but now they're using these sound clouds to hide material um, basically I think there are some um, private and highly classified documents that should not even be put on the web that should be put in a typewriter typed up and put in a file cabinet where someone has to come in and break into the room to take it. And I think the Russians um, have bought 1,200 typewriters and have set up a division that is going to put their highest level of classified documents in files, not on the Internet. I don't think that's a bad idea. All right. This, is, this is pertaining to the uh, inter or, I'm sorry, the, the Bible. The Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you mentioned I, was, I wasn't clear which one it was. Did you say that <coughs> hell or the devil is not in the Old or New Testament? Is that true? Yeah, which, there is no de devil. It is uh, Lucifer, who is the bringer of light, bringer of knowledge. Um, the devil, as Christians see it now. Hell is Christians see it now a place for eternal punishment, damnation, torture, endless, which makes no sense when you think about it. Because according to Revelations, there's a big war going on between the two sides. What soldiers are going to fight for you that you've tortured day and night? The first day they get on the battlefield, they're going to go, well, we surrender and go to the other side. So it doesn't even make any sense. But... Uh, what happened was you had Dante's Inferno. You had things that happened over the centuries that introduced the idea of hell being a place of torment and destruction and pain and all that. And uh, in point of fact, none of that is in the Bible. None of that's in the Old Testament. There is no doubt. And you know, there's another funny thing that happened that didn't start in Christianity to the 1800s. The idea of selling your soul to the devil. There is nothing in the Bible about being able to sell your soul. And they go, well, you know, the Beatles had to sell their souls to get all those hits. 
If that's all you had to do, do you know how many millions of bands would have hits right now? Well, to become a billionaire, all you have to do is sell your soul to the devil? Who in this room is going to say, I don't want to be a billionaire? But these myths have, because most Christians have never read the Bible since they were little kids, become real to them. And they're not real. Uh, what can we read that incorporates a lot of your thinking? In other words, uh, is there some book or publication that uh, debunks a lot of these things that we could read? Do you have a reference? Uh, um, British I, tabloids. <laughs> Chuck points out, um, I don't watch American news. I don't watch Fox. I don't watch MSNBC. Um, I watch the BBC online. I uh, do watch Democracy Now. I think that's a good show, although I wish the woman on Democracy Now would get a new hairstyle and a makeover. Because um, I hate the way she looks. But uh, most of the stuff I read is on the foreign press, is from them, not American press. American press, if it bleeds, it leads. It's always America-centric. You cut on the, the BBC and they go, well, in Rhodesia there were elections today. In Rhodesia there were elections today? What? You don't hear that on our news anywhere, not even at the end when they're running out of time. So uh, I, I actually urge people not to pay attention to the American news. Yeah, but 99%. I'm not talking about news. Hey, hey, hey. Is there something that uh, criticizes the Bible? It does a critique of the uh, commonly held beliefs in Christianity and the Bible oh, there's that we a thousand can read. Books on that. Oh. As Chuck, he seems to know a lot. Oh. Yeah, I got one. Charles? Wait, did I just refer someone to Chuck? What am I doing? I, I'd like to know uh, <laughs> what contribution that woman you were defending from Alaska has made to the political conversation in the United States. Well, I, th I think that Palin and and Coulter are I mean, basically trolls. She, it was the other woman. It started when she had that interview with another woman that it, she was shown to be pretty vacuous. And there was another no, I, woman. I said, well, she's not and a that was the key song of the laughter at, at her. And that was Katie Couric. And that's no. another woman. Uh -huh. And that's where she was asking the questions, and even Saturday Night Live, what did they do? They recreated that interview. No, they so didn't. They did changed she it. She never they said she could see the Russia from the porch. Oh, there's satire. But why are you then saying that it's men? Thank you, Steve. I, I myself, when I criticize She's liberal or democratic women, was comedian. I don't make up things about them, and I don't attack them for being women, and I don't say a woman isn't smart enough to figure that out. She must have had a sex change. It was that other woman. I think there's no was place in politics. That other woman, that woman who was portraying her, what's her name? All right. She was the one that was left making fun of her. Another that actress that could be Tina Fey. Yeah. So where do you say it was men? Because men repeated those jokes as if they were said by Palin, and they weren't. But they were also big on saying Ann Coulter had a sex change. If, if a Republican made the attacks on Pelosi's femininity or Hillary's, believe me, you would all be outraged. And yet those attacks go on against conservative women all the time. And I don't think they do you guys any good. Judging from the mid You have not established the name of any man. All right, okay, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Charlie. That's enough, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, that's we'll have a yeah, time yeah. It's straight bottle time. We already have a little line of rebuffers here. Yeah, I think that was more of a rebuttal, Chuck. I think it was. Charlie, didn't know Charlie's going to small. What do you, What do you think? Okay. About five. I'm going over here now. Listen to the rebuttal. About five minutes each.
where, where I get told that Sony doesn't matter and the more cyber attacks on us, the better, yes, I guess. Very so. well, All right. Five minutes. Let's thank him. Yay! Yay. Timer's up and made public tonight, so... Okay, good evening, folks. Uh, I uh, have an interesting thought here. I would like to uh, mention that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, could be a, uh, a great ally to the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, he could... Uh, uh, change his mind and decide that he wants his system to be capitalist and that he wants to support a democracy in his country. Uh, the uh, harder the shell is to crack, the sweeter the nut. And so I think that our task begins uh, with respect to Kim Jong-un is to make him laugh at himself. And if we can ever do that, that he might see everything in a different light. Uh, in the uh, Talmud, there is a uh, saying that goes, that goes, mighty is he, that makes of an enemy a friend. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, we, what we need to do is have more movies like The Interview and more things to make every kind of fun out of him till he finally views one of them and just really cracks up. I, I, um, Found, I haven't seen the movie The Interview, but I found myself thinking that those guys in his army, they have these hats that are very big, you know, like a captain's hat, but it's very large. And I, I kind of see uh, these guys coming to Kim Jong-un and saying, yes, we've managed to smuggle them in. And uh, they take the hat off and unzip it, and in there, uh, there's a pizza. One from New York City, and one from Philadelphia, and one from Chicago, because Kim Jong-un has a secret weakness for pizza. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the whole thing is, is to make Kim Jong-un laugh at himself. And I think after that, he might very well become a regular guy. Now, that's really all I have to say tonight, except that I have, I want to cap this off with one question. I, I find it interesting to consider how things might have, have gone if uh, Hitler and or Stalin had dropped acid. <laughs> we gave them Rodman. That was funny. <laughs> yeah, can you tell right? <laughs> I, hung up with Dennis. I want to thank you, Mike. Hello, Red. You, uh, Got, got me going tonight because you covered a lot of stuff and you did a good job at covering a lot of stuff and you awakened some of the things that uh, we all should be awakened uh, for this to we go what other guy. human beings say, what other human oh. beings write, ain't the Bible. And I mean that in, in quotation. In other words, the individual, and that should be you, me, and whoever, should make that choice. Now, he, he was uh, uh, mentioning the Bible and what wasn't in there and so forth and so on. Also mentioned uh, Britannica, the big uh, uh, book play uh, company, and there was errors there. So, to me, I'm the boss when it comes to the conclusion. And one way, and uh, it, 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 it is so obvious. It's so obvious. For instance, the book that we call the Bible is the Cain James Version. And we all have heard the fact that Cain James got 40 people somewhere, his friend or whatever, and they re wrote, rewrote the Bible. And that was a thousand years ago. That was a few hundred years ago. 
And I asked you a question rhetorically. What in the hell you think Cain and Abel put in the Bible? Something that would uh, help him. Something that nothing's going to be anti uh, uh, king in the in the Bible. And that goes for what's in any other book or what's in other mouth. Now, uh, the 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 uh, classic Homer, Euripides, Achilles, and so forth and so on, were people that was write fiction. They called themselves poor, and that's what they were. They ain't never claimed none of that shit they was right was true. And guess what? And we can come from the classic down to people that been named, like Dante and Virgil and Horace and, and Polidorus. They was right after the classic with, with the home and so forth and so forth. Purgatory is not in the Bible. That's out of that, uh, uh, Dante. Uh, 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 heaven and hell, the devil, that's out of Dante and Virgil. Virgil went down to hell with Horace. And he gets down there and he points out who was there, including the popes. And these were the first people that were burning down there, was popes and shit. Now, same Use the mic, with uh, uh, Dante. Huh? Use the mic. Oh, uh, same, with, same with Dante. Dante uh, gave, gave us paradise, that was heaven, gave us purgatory, that was, uh, that was the mill pot, and he gave us the infinity, that, that was hell. So, so uh, anybody that got a vocabulary, a pencil and a paper can write something that sounds good to a whole bunch of people. Does that make it true? No way. The guy wrote that, yes, Virginia, that is a Santa Claus. It must have been written pretty good because they put it in the paper, they put it in the book, and so forth and so on, and he was talking to them. So what happened? What, what made things wrong? People take shit that man write, and he run, they runs off like he done said something that were real. Well, I call what he said, what he do, and what he made the Truman Show. Ain't nothing natural about what he does. He cannot stay out of the Rose Hill Cemetery. He can't walk on motherfucking water. And he don't know no more than no other human being. Because first thing, if he knew anything more than other human being, he would go to Rose Hill. So what do you do when you want to defend yourself against all this propaganda and all this bullshit that is written and talking about? What do you do? You go over and read the book for yourself. You read the classic, and then you read the Old Testament right away. You said, now, which one is still it from the other one? First of all, like I said earlier, the person didn't claim that was true, but later on, some person that wants to use it for the, uh, the uh, brainwash the masses, they uh, sell it off as though it was true. And you have people say things like, I mean, I've heard it a thousand times. They said, uh, when I talk about King Jane, you talk about what? What was written over here was written over there, and like uh, uh, Flores said earlier, people don't, have, don't know shit about the Bible because they don't read it. But it's a whole bunch of stuff that they should read if they want to talk about the Bible. Do they read the Talmud? Do they read the Torah? Do they read? Do they read? Uh, uh, like I said, a classic and some of the people we name? No, because they go believe. But so and so said they gonna believe because it's on television. They gonna believe this. They gonna believe that. Well, the best defense against this bullshit propaganda is logic and philosophy. And I'm not talking about any philosophy. I'm talking about Your all time's of them. up. And, and, and why I'm quiet? I said. All right. Your time's up. All right, Gene Horker. Okay. Um. I hope I can read what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I'm blissfully ignorant of the uh, internet. Uh, I solve all my problems on the internet by putting nothing in it. I have nothing in my computer. If I ever have any problem with my computer, it's easily solved. I call a guy named Charles Ray, not Ray Charles. He fixes it, no problem. Okay, uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, we heard a lot about the Democratic Party, but tell me something I don't know, buddy. 
uh, it is well known that the Democratic Party for years and years and years and years has been full of racists. Tell me something I don't know. That's well known. It's also well known that, that uh, President Wilson was a big racist. Uh, you can read about that in uh, James Lowen, uh, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me. You can also read about it in For the Kingdom and the Power, which is the kind of story of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, around 1920. So in those two books, it'll let, at least those two will tell you about uh, uh, President Wilson. To me, the guy has been highly overrated. Uh, Christmas. Uh, at Christmas Eve, uh, I went to my church uh, being agnostic. Uh, I was interested in what we would be doing, singing some hymns, and my minister uh, set me at ease by saying, tonight we have permission to believe the unbelievable. I had a great time. All right, all right. All right Mike, a great presentation. Appreciate you very much. Just two things about your presentation. One is I want to agree with Charlie that, uh, Charlie, are you listening? Yeah, I think that sure. Charlie and I are the only ones in the room that agree about this. No one owes anyone anything on the world wide web. It is for the world, it is not the USA's web, it is yeah. the right world wide web. Yes. So Charlie, you may agree on that. Second thing is, I guarantee you, if somebody has a Bible, at least five times in there it talks about homosexuality, it phrases it, no man shall lay with another man. If that's not homosexuality, I think, I think not. Jesus I'm mistaken. It. It's in the New Testament. Yes, no, sir. I said Jesus no. never said it. Oh, oh, that's why. Good, good, good. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> Never mind, I'm not second note, okay? <laughs> At least it was good. Yeah. All right, so, so, so I'm a newcomer to your group. College of Complexes, your passion, your intelligence, your depth, your diversity of opinions are what I love about this group. The College of Complexes is a playground for people who think, truly, truly, people who agree and disagree with our viewpoints. In the last six months, I'm starting to attend talks, movies, lectures, etc., where I agree from the, where I disagree from the outset of the topic, but it helps me to become more tolerant and accepting of those who differ with my opinions. Not easy, believe me. I, I sit there and seethe a lot of times and have to bite my tongue. I'm doing it to grow. I like opinionated people. <laughs> <coughs> well, I do, because it's a good character trait, because they thought about their positions and took or take a stand. They are very important to our American way of life. I appreciate all you opinionated people. <clears throat> my background is the field of accounting, so I understand the internal workings of a business, a business deal, or sales and tax expenses, a household also has revenue or paychecks and expenses, and government also has revenue or taxes and expenses. All three entities operate the same exact way. There is no difference in a household budget to a corporate budget to a government budget. They all need some sort of income, and they all have expenses. The reason I bring that up is because back in August, the taxation guy was over here saying that you're crazy if you're going to operate your uh, household or your business like the government. And let me tell you, he, his thinking is off. All three operate the same way. All three need a rainy day fund. That's what he's truly trying to say. When times are bad, government has to dig into a rainy day fund to help the people. Same thing with your household. If you get laid off or papa dies, you got to lay into your nest egg to uh, uh, help you out during rough times. Same with a business, when the sales are slow, you dig into your, uh, <clears throat> your, your, your nest day. So anyway, I just wanted to share that about that. My name is Steve, and I'm pro-constitution and pro-capitalism. <laughs> the greatest yes. way to bring out the best in, in us is capitalism. You can aspire to be the janitor, or you can aspire to be the president, or somewhere in between. And just because I'm pro-capitalism, does not mean that I'm against socialism, which exists in at least nine areas of our very core of life, okay? 
<clears throat> Socialism does exist in America. It is the transfer of wealth and it occurs every day. Anyone can get a free education. Huh? K through 12, it's called a free education. That's a form of socialism, you know, it's beautiful. And also, you can get a bachelor's degree if you're highly motivated, and if you're a non-white male, you can easily get grants and scholarships for that four-year degree, or a trade school. Please, let's not forget the trades, the very needed, very needed aspect of our society, like plumbers, electricians, pipe fitters, truck drivers, carpenters, mechanics. Beautiful, we need those people. Second area is health care. We have free clinics all over the city. You ever got to go to a doctor. Also, we have Stroger Hospital. That's socialism, y'all. That's social. We're taking care of the needy. We do not neglect the needy. We have a socialism net. It's beautiful. Next one is food. We have food depository in, in Cook County. Next one is uh, housing, Section 8. You've seen those ads on TV and the Internet. Next one, Social Security checks. Retired 62 and beyond get a check. Next, next one, next area of socialism, Medicare, 60, oh, 65 and up. Free libraries, you get free books and CDs. I'm going fast as my time is up. Workers' comp for folks that are injured. Medicaid, second highest expense in the state of Illinois. Our socialism is designed as a net to catch all. We have an American that's thriving. Thank goodness for socialism as a social net in America. Yay. 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 Thank the Lord for socialism. Yay, Steve. Steve, where are you going? God given. Yeah, God -given. Jonathan, some of you know me from Democracy for the USA. I've been here before. Uh, I love this topic, common beliefs and ideas accepted as reality. Now, whether that's on social networks or anywhere around this time of year, we all know the uh, biggest myth that we're constantly flooded with and constantly is attempted to groom into our brains by countless sources, is if we buy enough things, we'll be so happy this time of year. Just consume, consume, consume. So I'm very glad the last speaker went, because I have a good counter to his points. Uh, my argument is that's not what makes us happy. What makes us happy as human beings is peace. That doesn't cost anything if we all show up for peace. What makes us really happy is love. That doesn't cost us anything if we all show up for love. What makes us really happy is democracy, participatory democracy, I must stress. Because a lot of people think what we have right now is democracy. And actually, it's not. It's representative oligarchy. But if everybody shows up for democracy, that doesn't cost us anything at all either. Uh, what makes people really happy is transparency. If everybody shows up for transparency, that doesn't cost us anything. What makes us really happy, or especially this time of year, the holidays time, no matter what people's beliefs or not beliefs, beliefs may be, is justice. And that doesn't cost anything either. If we all show up for justice, that is what's most important. And most of all, and this is kind of a new issue for a lot of us, but we're coming up to the various challenges that are before us, respect for Mother Earth. Now, if we all show up for respect for Mother Earth, that doesn't cost us anything either. It might take time and energy in adapting to new ways of coexisting with this beautiful planet we have, but we don't have to buy anything for that. We can just cooperate in solidarity and unity and work together. So that's the reality, and I'm just glad we're here today sharing what's most important, not material things and money and trying to get the rat race championship belt on our, and the crown of we've got the most stuff before we all go to that beautiful place, wherever that place is for each and every one of us. Uh, peace, love, democracy, transparency, justice, respect for Mother Earth. That's what's most important to us as human beings. So I'm glad the last speaker went, because uh, that's my counterpoint to his point. On a completely unrelated note, I think Amy Goodman's hair is absolutely beautiful, and I love her reporting. So whoever said that, uh, I love democracy now, too, and I have to strongly disagree. I think she has a great haircut, and I think she's my favorite journalist of all time. And when I watch her every morning, I feel like my brain is actually getting the information that uh, all the other networks are too afraid to report. So thanks for uh, 
everybody showing up here tonight, and I gave a flyer to everybody, buy nothing this Christmas and find out how much peace, love, democracy, transparency, justice, and respect for Mother Earth you have more time and more energy for. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Mike. Oh, what? Sorry, four. Okay. I'd like to thank Mike. Thank Mike for uh, giving a good presentation. As always, he did a. Hold on, we'll take a minute. There's a whole bunch of commotion in the back. Hold on. And that's Charlie. Hey! And that's Charlie. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Hey, let's have a round for the waitress's daughter visiting tonight. Oh, yes. Okay. We'll restart the clock, Andy. Restart up there. When you're ready. Start at five minutes. Okay. starting to get like a Grateful Dead. Takes an hour to survive. Mike made uh, several good points tonight. And um, the, one of the first things that stuck out, uh, he said, you know, reality is things that are real. And, um, you know, we're, we have to live in the real world. So, you can give a talk, uh, like I'm holding up a ketchup bottle right now. Can we ever, everybody agree this is a ketchup bottle? Yes. We'd want okay. to test it first. <laughs> well, you can give, if I was giving a talk on something else, or, or I could give a speech on this all night, and a couple people say, why'd you talk about bananas tonight, Andy? I thought, well, I thought that something was going to be ketchup. They're just immune to facts. You can hold up something like this, well, that's a banana. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. What do you do with a person that denies the reality right in front of their face? That's the question I've been wrestling with for seven years, eight years since I've been coming here. This is a picture out of a current book that shows an aerial photograph of all seven buildings. Seven buildings were taken down on 9-11. How does this rebut? And it goes right to the idea that we were attacked by Al-Qaeda. 9-11 was a false flag operation. When we want to go into some country, we kill a few of our own citizens and blame it on Iraq or Afghanistan. So all of a sudden, what's going on in North Korea? Why do we have to have sanctions against North Korea all of a sudden? What is going on? Uh, as Charlie pointed out, America didn't suffer a new Pearl Harbor. Nobody died. Charlie is absolutely on money. You listen to Charlie? Yeah. You were absolutely, you, Charlie and uh, Gene Anderson are totally correct in saying, why are we drumming up this fear against North Korea right now? Well, it's because America has a huge, giant military industrial complex that has a global domination project going on. And incidentally, he mentioned John Bolton. Uh, John Bolton was one of the people uh, back about 25 years, 30 years ago in the Reagan administration that was known to be certifiably insane, talking about winning nuclear war as long as we strike first. John Bolton was among a group of those people that just want to attack everybody with nukes. That's who that man is. So why do you think Obama put it in? Uh, the question, Obama may have picked him because uh, it's becoming more and more clear. If you, uh, last week, uh, the week before I held up this book, Censored News, it's one of the premier journalism projects on the planet. And somebody came up to me afterwards and he says, Andy, that's not journalism, that's just a bunch of crap. That's not uh, what I said, Andy. You, it was close. No, it wasn't. I paraphrase it. Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, hey, hey, come on, one at a time. Yeah. If we're going to move forward, we're going to have to realize that the media, the media in America run a two-pronged process. They promote the myth, whatever it is that they're promoting, if it's a myth they want us to believe, live in a mythical bubble, they promote that myth on all channels, and they simultaneously run a coordinated blackout where if you are a media person and you speak out, 
you get fired and blackballed. Your career goes into the buzzsaw, as the title of this book by Christina Borgesson describes stories of Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, investigative journalists that one day try to report a story that the billionaires didn't want the American people to find out about. They got fired and blackballed, their career was over. There's certain kinds of things you can't talk about in America. And one thing that is never in the media is what was talked about in the 2011 edition of Censored News. Pick up a copy of Censored News and look at the pages of false flag operations where the American media and the military lied to us about some fictitious attack on us and we got to go invade that country. And some people uh, just totally uh, cannot handle the facts on this kind of stuff and uh, they're immune to the facts. Project Censored has been up and running for 37 years. They lied us into the Vietnam War. They lied to us about Afghanistan. They lied to us about Iraq. We went into Iraq on a total pack of lies. And it's all about oil and oil profits and the major coal, oil, nukes, and gas controlling supplies all over the world. That's what it's all about. And water. And, and oh, no. water is oil, the new, water is a new hole. Well, the fracking, the last thing I'll say, give me, give me 10 seconds. This rush for fracking is not about energy, it's about the new gold rush for water. Fracking destroys the water table, and you can pipe in clean water, charge $10 a gallon, or whatever people will pay. That's where we are, and uh, we have to help people learn this stuff. Come see me afterwards if anybody wants to list the website. as a, 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 a study by a journalist of hidden stories is nothing of the kind. It is written by sociologists at a California university who do not understand journalism, and it is not what Andy portrays it to be. And that's what I told you, Andy. Not that it was crap. Please do not misquote me. It goes to the point that we can have our own realities. And one of the most frequently spouted realities, which is not reality, is about 9-11 in this particular room. 9-11 happened. Millions of people saw it. Millions of people brought these things out and photographed it. Millions saw planes crash into buildings which fell down. They were not blown up. No. Secondary sources bring a person in this room to that conclusion. We have to look at primary sources for a reality. Mike, Correct. would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Let's go back to that picture, if we could, which we will not be able to probably, of the dear departed gangster who died in an alley you want here this? in Chicago. No. I don't want to see and that. That's the reality. No, the reality. If you're going to slander me, get it right. One right. bullet at a time. Whose turn is it here, Andy? We're going to take this up in a month anyway. Okay, I stopped the clock. I won't be here. I won't need to listen to it. <laughs> okay. The gangster. I was judging a, a history project, and the kid brought up a bunch of websites saying that this gangster who was on the slideshow, John, John Dillinger, thank him. I don't want to bring up his name because he you know, might be a personal friend of somebody here. <laughs> <laughs> was alive and well and living in southern Indiana. <laughs> there are websites showing that. <laughs> How many people here believe that John Dillinger was alive and well and living Wait, in any place? Yes, she is. No. Oh, Mike, no. put up his hands. No. Now look, <laughs> primary sources yes. at the time of the, the incident on Lincoln Avenue, he was dead. There was blood on the street. Primary sources, the Chicago Tribune, showed his dead body in the morgue. 
primary sources. Primary sources on 9-11 show those buildings going down underneath aircraft. Secondary sources by nutcases say it was blown up. Yeah. Next. That's me. All right, Brom. Yeah. Well, uh, this evening's presentation was supposed to something be something about the uh, Christ myths or yeah, yeah where'd that go? It's something to do with Christ. Well, as uh, as near as uh, our speaker got to it, was something about uh, death uh, or uh, hell. Uh, Actually, there were seven did, slides on that. What? There were seven yeah, slides. Yeah, John and the Whale. There's the Magi. Adam and oh, Eve. Oh, yes. Right. Adam and Eve. Were you paying well, attention, Ron? Okay. <laughs> there was, <laughs> it, it was certainly not the bulk of the presentation. But uh, even so, that's uh, there. What was the myth? Uh, I'm afraid that the myth is the uh, romance uh, that develops uh, between uh, the church and uh, virginity. That Mary was a virgin, which meant a, a woman eligible to be married. <laughs> of an age to be married. Uh, basically, that's what it meant. Uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, or God with us. It, th this was the embodiment figure for the promises of God the promises of deliverance, the promises of hope for the future. And what is hell but wasting life? How much? Make, making nothing of your, your hopes for the future or uh, the, the, the promises uh, that life has and gives us. So, uh, I'm afraid that they turned that, that the promise of virginity, the promise of, of uh, motherhood and of, uh, of new life, into, oh, she didn't have sex with a man. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. She married, she was betrothed to and married Joseph. She calls Joseph to Jesus. She says, your father and I. Yeah. What's that in the Bible? That's in Luke. And the story about when Jesus accompanies uh, uh, his uh, parents uh, to, to the temple when he's 12 years old. Okay, and I All think it's right. in chapter four, right? Well, and it's three or four, right? Okay. Uh, you mustn't be Christian. You read the Bible. <laughs> well, I'm not very religious. I'm a Methodist. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it's you know what what was in the Bible. I mean, uh, the the people who wrote. The, the Gospels and the New Testament uh, were talking about a man people had known and dealt with, lived with, uh, who meant something to them. He was to them the guy who spoke for God, acted for God, was God inspired, full of the Holy Spirit, and had gotten them to be full of the Holy Spirit so that they were empowered to speak to other people about their sins and about their 
their, their hopes for real life and to move people to be at peace with one another and with the world and uh, mm -hmm. making a new world, one closer to God's mm -hmm. intentions. Well, Hi, I'm uh, Pat Butler, and I am a journalist. I think we should know this, just as they do at the AA meetings, you know. I, I, I am a, anyway. Not your second name. <laughs> Not my second name. Besides, I don't remind you of that. I, I don't. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Mike, an excellent presentation. Aside from the obvious heresies, uh, <laughs> in the first place, let's understand, the Bible was never intended to be a history book, nor was it intended to be coverage of a major news event. There were no reporters from the New York Times, writers, or even inside publications on the scene at that time. What it is, is the collective wisdom of 50 different authors believed to have been inspired by God over a period of 1,500 years. Uh, it is the tribal wisdom of one group of people in the Middle East at a time when uh, they were in a position to influence over a period of time a lot of people, hence our Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, it is not something, look, most serious Bible scholars and theologians do not take the Bible literally. They do not go word for word and say this is literally true. It is intended to be a guidebook, and a guidebook to be followed by intelligent people uh, bent on doing the right thing, or at least most of the time, the right thing. Uh, so let's let's understand that this business of quoting the Bible word for word. I mean, I could turn around and say, as far as the virgin birth, there is a line in the Bible that says where Mary asks the angel, "How shall this be? For I know not man." Now there was no reporter there at the time when that happened, so we're talking about a lot of collective wisdom. Let's let's look at it from the long view. Mike, one thing I will uh, point out to you, uh, despite your excellent uh, presentation, our first environmental laws were not given to us by Richard Nixon, if I heard you right. They were given to us by my favorite president, Teddy Roosevelt. He was the guy that gave us the national parks. He was the guy that first made Americans conscious of the need to, in a big way, uh, preserve our environment. Where Mike is absolutely, when incidentally, uh, I realize that there are people who have criticized Anne Graham for celebrating Christmas. But Christmas, Christmas can be celebrated in a variety of ways. I am probably the only person in this room who, although a practicing Christian, also celebrates Saturnalia the Roman feast of Saturnalia, which was a time for celebration and all of that, uh, you know, much much like a cross between Christian and, uh, uh, Christmas and New Year's. Uh, you know, and, and, and there's no conflict, whatever. So happy Saturnalia for those who also follow that. Um, Mike, you are right on the money, however, <coughs> in warning people tonight not to take our friend Kim, too lightly. Here is a man who has his finger on nuclear weapons. Here is, is a man who commands a fairly sizable army. And here is a man who is, by all accounts, mentally unbalanced. Now, when you give a person who has severe psychiatric problems, and you give him an army, and you give him nuclear weapons, you create problems far more than the hacking of Sony, although that is a problem, and that is a problem that needs to be dealt with. The truth of the matter is, 
this guy can create a lot of mischief on the world scene because of the fact that he has these tools well beyond his level of capability by all accounts. As I said two weeks ago, here's a guy who took his own uncle, charged him with corruption, and threw him into an arena and fed him to wild dogs. <laughs> rumor, mi rumor mill, rumor mill, rumor mill. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, according to rumor, uh, witnessed by a number of people. Uh, these are the kinds of things that bespeak an individual who must be watched. Oh, I'm not yeah. saying we should drop bombs on the guy tomorrow. I am simply saying that this is an individual. Look, in the 1930s, if, if people had watch. said, watch that paper hanger from Munich, yeah. He could be dangerous. Right. We'd have been better off if we'd followed that advice. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, I'll be quick. Light that sing, up, Charlie. Let's Come thank on. our speaker again. Yay! I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Uh, there's no, there's no law. There's nothing in the Constitution establishing a right to privacy. There's certainly nothing establishing the right of corporate privacy. Um, except for possibly intellectual property or copyright, in which there's been established defined procedures to be followed by the parties. Just kind of making this up as you go along. And as he said, there's no expectation of privacy. These are information storage systems, and as far as I know, there's no international treaties. There's no established protocols regarding any of it, let alone justification for killing other people, which is warfare. Um, it, it simply isn't there. I'm not an expert on this area. I'm not, as a matter of fact, uh, to give you a case in point, I registered for an academic conference. It's amazing the information that I get I, on people that simply look at our website without your knowledge, your awareness, your cognizance. I signed up for an academic conference. I had certain features, but I found out that they were, they were digging, mining information about me, and I reported that it was a private association putting on the conference that I reported them to the university. As I said, I even checked it twice and I said, I don't know what's going on here, but if you, if you sign up for this conference, there's all sorts of things that kicked in the action in terms of my computer, which is way beyond what they do. Um, if, 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 we, if we made something about killing the President of the United States, I don't know. But I think you'd get into a little difficulties and some problems here. But you seem to think that you can make media things like this about killing the president of another country. You never well, heard why, why do you, what's the double standard here? You never heard of suddenly? You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't do this. Suddenly? Seriously. Um, you, you cannot hide behind free speech. This was, and it's an indictment of your entertainment industry. I don't really care too much for the Hollywood productions, but when they make movies like this with these kind of central features and puppets fornicating, I don't wonder what kind of media this is. It's an embarrassment to this nation. Do we have any standards? This is there other cultures. I have to, like we have to respect porn. their thing. fornicating puppets. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go to war about this. The right to have fornicating puppet movies <laughs> <laughs> that are insulting. You don't have any respect for other. That shows what kind of country we are. That we just, we just disregard. We don't care. That's ridiculous. You don't know anything about the UN. The UN is steeped in protocols. You got to respect that. We got in this church stuff and religion. I spent many, many years on this. Every religion comes up with all sorts of things, they call it catechism, dogma, what was it, Curtis, um, what are the things? The Baltimore Catechism. Yes, catechism, things like this, they developed it, all sorts of theologians. <laughs> the apple thing has nothing to do with apples. Obviously, Adam and Eve were going to do what boys and girls do sometimes. 
one set. Take out the thing. We're going to do yada, yada, yada. Can you use But you can't cheat Sunday school the kids and say, yeah, the machine. We're going to, like, fuck, you know? <laughs> so you say, but you have some little thing. They were just to eat an apple, you know? <laughs> That's where it comes from. That's what they eat a forbidden fruit is. Like, well, you know, they used like, to say, no. <laughs> they used to say Adam knew Eve. Yeah, something like I, that. In today's and, Catholic Bible, it says Adam married Eve. Yeah. I want to know who now, married Eve. The them. other thing about Joseph is they had these medieval plays. And Joseph was always like a running character. He was like some kind of like dunce or idiot. Because he didn't know his, his wife, you know, like, where did you get this son, you know? I got all the Lord Angel gave him to me. You know, like, he was an idiot. Uh, in these medieval fashion plays, the comic interlude here, um, but, and the other thing about something about Jesus, well, Jesus never talked about this. Jesus actually, I think, only made 263 or 283 statements that they've segregated. And last of all, um, Sarah Palin is, right. is an embarrassment to this nation. She's an embarrassment to the political Hi, party ding. that gave her a nomination. Ding, ding, ding. It's, an, it's an embarrassment to our political process that we could find no one with any qualifications but someone like a Beverly Hillbilly. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Hey, trailer hey, fan. Time's up, I think they were going to be a president in the United States. Or I got a little hey, hey, that's a slap on the yeah. 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 Some trailer <laughs> trap. Oh, oh, gets all my tracks. tracks. <laughs> Stupid names. <laughs> what a part of it like her. Yeah. They all got those names like <laughs> Truck and yeah. Truck. Track yeah. Troop. <laughs> Oh, hey, I spoke about this. So we can I am just going to go be around. very, very fast and very, very quick. Uh, this brings the whole lecture into a nutshell. Oh, You get the idea. Well, I have a lot of rebuttals for people that are no longer here, but I was told that the bus stops running at 9.15, so... There's one, one coming by right now. Um, first off, my definition of the word myth. Myth, this will help you in life, is my, the, okay? My is in me. The? What is the word the until you add the word into it? The end. What is the word the before that? Infinite. Myth is my infinite self. Um, as for Mary's virginity, um, the first hundred years of the Catholic or the Christian faith within the Jewish religion was actually in the Jewish religion 150 years before they split off. No one knew Mary was a virgin. And if you put the books of the Bible in order by year, which they're not, but if you put them in order by year, in the books written closest to when he was alive, no one mentions Jesus being a, born of a virgin or anything special about the birth at all. The later books, uh, Matthews, etc., that are written 150 to 200 years after Jesus died, claim to know he was a came from a virgin birth. Um, 
Now, of course, we know about Zeus. I mentioned Zeus earlier. Uh, Zeus, of course, had a son, Hercules, that he got from impregnating an earth woman. Uh, Zeus went out on, into the world and had many adventures and ended up dying a horrific, tortured death for all of us. Well, we can all write that off as silly because none of us believe in Zeus. Unless, of course, there's correlations to other deities. Um, now, Kim Jong Un, uh, someone said, who's gone now, unfortunately, um, what would have happened if Hitler and Stalin had dropped acid? Well, I don't know about Stalin, but we do know that from 1939 on, Adolf Hitler had four shots of crystal methadrine a day and had to be given a shot of opium, morphine, in order to go to sleep at night. I don't know if you've seen the show Breaking Bad. I don't know if you've ever heard of people on crystal methadrine, but after about four or five years of doing that, you can see why he'd be insane. He was actually a pretty... Uh, hands-off leader. He didn't wake up until 4 p.m. He wasn't told about the D-Day invasion because he didn't go to bed till 5 in the morning. So what was he doing running the daily affairs of the German government? Well, he wasn't. He was out of it. Uh, he would wake up, have a meal, then his buddy would come over and they'd plan on what the new Germany would look at and build these models all night while being injected with dope. So Hitler was a crystal methadrine addict, and after four or five years of this, 1942, he declares he's going to start killing the Jews in the camps. If you've seen Breaking Bad, and you've seen how insane people get on crystal methadrine after just a few months, imagine being injected with that four or five times a day. Now, um... <coughs> Let's see. No, that's that's actually totally accepted. That's you can find no, it on you gotta Google. Google. You got a chemical um, cocktail. It's on Wikipedia. Blood meth. No, it's not just Wikipedia. No, this Breaking the doctor. The, the doctor that Hitler had actually came forward. There's documentaries done on it in Europe. Um, it is true. Uh, he was a crystal methadrine addict. <laughs> um, that also so explains the uh, shaking hands as well from doing so much of the drug. Um, now, this, someone was saying about the racism in the Democratic Party. Um, all you had, I lived in, Bron in Bronzeville for a year. And I went in, and I was the only, I, I would say there were three white people in the entire neighborhood. I was there for a year, so I went into the restaurants, the bars, the clubs, uh, the diners, everything else. You cannot believe what is said about Jews, Asians, and Arabs. It is, uh, I grew up in the South at the end of segregation. Okay, so I met Klansmen and I met people who were out in the open about their racism. You want to hear what I used to hear in the 60s? Go to Brownsville. They don't, they called Mayor Rahm the Jew. Okay, they call him the Jew. Maxwell Street was Jew town. Um, they stand in front of the stores when the Arabs are praying, and they stand in front of them going, how long are these goddamn Arabs going to be in there praying? Why are they doing this shit? Um, the racism is unbelievable. Go to Bronzeville. Go to Bridgeport. When you go to Bridgeport, you'll quickly discover that there are loads of people who don't like blacks, Jews, Arabs. They like Asians. They let Asians live in Bridgeport, which they never would have before. Why? Because Asians stay silent, they don't complain, and they pay in cash. And that's why Bridgeport opened up to them. It wasn't that long ago that Mayor Daly's son had a baseball bat 
to beat up black kids that were still in Bridgeport after dark. It wasn't that long ago. There is racism within the Democratic Party. They just cover it up. One of the biggest things we did that was a mistake as a Vietnam War protester was that my friends were exhausted by 1974. So they folded into the Democratic Party, the same party that killed Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, the same party that beat people up, the same party that illegally broke into the SDS headquarters, um, and they allowed the Democrats to take their rhetoric so that the Democrats could stand there and say that they were for all these positive things for the people. We've got to help the poor. We've got to get money together to help the poor. And then they took that money and they built a new Bears stadium. You see, you can't listen to what they say. Look at what they do. Why is the South Number one. Republican? Why is the South Republican? Now, the second thing is, no, it's not. Yes, it is. It wasn't under Clinton. Get out of here. Um, now, somebody who was an agnostic mentioned that they had a church, which is an odd thing, but you know the agnostic oh. prayer. Dear I'll God, right if there thing. is one, could you grant this prayer? If you do that sort of thing, I'm not sure how an agnostic can have a church, but anyway. Um, Unitarian. Now, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, yeah. Chicago fought longer than any city in the South having blacks on the fire department, police department, transit. They fought longer than anyone else. The only battle they've come closer to fighting just as hard is trying to deny the Second Amendment to people in Illinois after the Supreme Court told Chicago you can't block people from having guns in Chicago. Guess what Chicago did? Mayor Daley said his famous statement, we'll take it to a higher court. Liberals believe there's a higher court beyond the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. um, is that what? the right exercise? Can you happens? imagine how many millions of dollars we flushed down the toilet trying to play using liberals' rhetoric, using our old rhetoric from the 60s when we were protesters to cover up police torture, which Democrats refused to investigate? Now, the cyber world is a new world. It is capable of bringing us all together, but it is also wide open to attack. Where we have rights that are defined to us in this room, we are not even discussing what rights we should have on the internet what expectations we should have in cyberspace. Someone else, I think you, sir, I forget your name, I'm sorry, I haven't met you before. Jonathan. You were talking about love and things like that that you can't buy over Christmas. I'd just like to tell you that as an older person, no, you can't buy love, but you sure as hell can rent it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that later. <clears throat> um, Christmas teaches kids about capitalism, teaches kids about the joys of giving, and also teaches kids that it's possible to get objects that have no other purpose than making you feel pleasure and happy. And that's a pretty strong message. And while that is a message rejected by most of the people in this room, that is a message which I think is the best part of Christmas and why atheists should participate in Christmas. Um, let's see. Christmas. Uh, oh, on Nixon. Um, Teddy Roosevelt did start national parks, etc., but OSHA... The rules about the environment, all of this stuff started under Nixon. And guess who fought Nixon on it? 
the environmental groups. They were freaked out that a Republican was going to do this, so they just went into overdrive and tried to stop him. And yet today, if you say, you know, you guys were right for attacking Nixon, for stopping OSHA, let's break down that group now. Watch what they do. They're not going to say the same thing. Um, let's see. Oh, Chuck, you mentioned there's no way we would have in our country movies about presidents being assassinated. Well, there's a movie called Suddenly with Frank Sinatra, uh, which, by the way, is an incredible movie. It's on YouTube if you want to watch it for free. Uh, Suddenly <laughs> is about uh, Frank Sinatra, who plays a Lee Harvey Oswald type, going to assassinate the President of the United States. Um, Executive Action is a movie starring Burt Lancaster, and it proposes that a bunch of corporations got together to kill JFK. Then there's the movie JFK, which I thought was weird, because I was in New Orleans in 1970 when the Ku Klux Klan announced that a gay conspiracy had killed JFK and they passed out a flyer and I read the flyer because the Klan used to stand on the corner and just pass out flyers. Years later I'm watching Oliver Stone's JFK movie and every scene is right out of the Ku Klux Klan flyer. Now maybe if you guys believe there was a conspiracy against JFK you need to apologize to the Klan um, because Oliver Stone stole it all from them. Uh, and there was no... Uh, I, I, when I was in New Orleans, of course, uh, when Mardi Gras ended, because we were hippies with long hair, I had hair then, um, we had to go and hide because the police came through and everybody with long hair, they arrested. And you were told either you clean the streets or you were going to jail for a week. Um, so as soon as Mardi Gras ended, we went running and hiding because the police were coming down looking for long hairs. So here I'm watching this Oliver Stone movie, and there's Kevin Costner. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I saw a black guy who was having a lunch with a white woman. He was wearing a suit and tie. She was dressed up nice. And two New Orleans policemen, because in... 1970, no Creoles were allowed on the police force. Um, they went up and pulled the black guy out of the cafe, beat him with their clubs, while the woman screamed, this is a business meeting, this is not a date. And they just beat the hell out of him. Um, that's who Oliver Stone wants you to think is a hero? This is his argument against Oswald killing JFK? An old Ku Klux Klan argument? Really, you're going into a sewer if you follow Oliver Stone on that. Um, there's also, let's see, what else I have jotted down here? Um, somebody mentioned copyrights and how copyrights were an important thing. Um, when the British came up with copyrights, it was to stop the Catholics. King James, who was a Catholic, had been kicked out of the, uh, uh, not White House, but kingdom, or whatever you want to call it. And Catholics were barred from holding political office. Um, Shakespeare uh, did not want his work done. Every time you go to see a play of Shakespeare's today, okay, it is against his will. In his last will and testament, Shakespeare says, no one is to do my plays ever again, okay? So he refused to have his plays published. And a bunch of bootleggers started, those who supported King James, who Shakespeare liked, because Shakespeare was actually a secret Catholic, if you've read Romeo and Juliet. And um, Shakespeare... Uh, like them, so he would give them copies of their scripts, and they had really good copies. Then there was the mob, 
The mob wanted to do bootlegs of his plays, so they would sit there with quill and ink and write as fast as they could as the play was going on, which is why in the first edition of Hamlet, it says to be or not to be married. Because the guy writing it was just writing as fast as he could. You get a quill and a bottle of ink and see how fast you can write. And that's what they were doing to get a published version of Shakespeare. And then there was a third group, which was the geeks. They were like the Star Trek fans. They loved Shakespeare and was part of the reason the critics hated Shakespeare, which is why he didn't want his plays done afterwards. So they began to suspect that these versions of Shakespeare's plays that were coming out, that were the most reliable versions of his plays, were coming out for Catholics. And it turned out that group was giving the money to pro-Catholic groups who wanted Catholics to still be able to be in royalty in England. And um, um, at any rate, um, uh, the copyright laws came in because if you didn't copyright with the government your work, you could be faced with five years in jail. However, if what you tried to copyright was pro-Catholic, you could get five years in jail. So copyrights were brought in in order to censor people, not to liberate people. Now, the thing that we have to do is start thinking about the cyber world. What does that mean? What does the internet mean? What does the cyber world mean? How do we um, how do we decide what in the cyber world is real? What parts of our constitution goes there? You know, the internet, the WWW, was American when it started. It was used in secret by our, our intel in the 1960s. When it was decided to turn the internet over to the public, the Democrats went to Ronald Reagan and said, we know you're going to want to want the FCC in charge. And he said no, for whatever reason. In fact, probably one of the only positive things Reagan ever did he gave us the internet with no strings attached. Oh, he was wonderful. So we have to start asking, now that we have this thing called the internet, where do our rights begin and end? What happens when another country can take us down without firing a shot? That's what I hope. That's what I hope you get out of this talk. Thank you.